Yeah, guten afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you like the trailer. So uh, I think it's quite impressive as Mosaic is itself. My name is Anja Sommerfeld and I'm the project manager of the Mosaic project. And I really thank Arctic Circle that uh, we got the opportunity to have a session here in the plenary. Um, I think most of you heard already about Mosaic, but I will start my presentation with a short introduction. Um, is this working? So, Mosaic is a multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of Arctic climate. That means uh, we will investigate the coupled Arctic climate system for one year in the Central Arctic. Mosaic is the largest research expedition ever, and it started on 20 September this year and will last until October 2020. It involves five icebreakers, more than 17 institutes from 19 nations, and 17 of these nations will be on board Polarstern. In total, we will have 300 scientists in the Central Arctic during the year. In September 2020, uh, we started with Polarstern uh, up north. So we entered the Siberian sector of the Arctic and um, build, find a nice flow there. So that is already done, the first step. And we will start now with um, putting up the central observatory, so put all our instruments next to the ship on the ice floe. In addition, we were joined by a Russian icebreaker, Akademik Fedorov, and that icebreaker will bring um, out the distributed network station. So that are satellite stations um, that are in 50 kilometer distance to Polarstern, and they work autonomously. For one year, both the distributed network and the central observatory will drift through the Arctic towards the Atlantic sector of the Arctic. Of the, yeah, yeah. But nobody wants to stay for one year on an icebreaker, so we will have regular visits from um, research icebreakers from partner institutes. They will exchange scientists and crew members, and in addition, they will bring fuel and food. In addition, we will have an aircraft campaign with the research aircrafts Polar 5 and Polar 6, and uh, they will extend the coverage of the, of the, um, of the measurements. In uh, agreement with the visits of the supply icebreakers, we, bring, we divided our, um, our expedition into six legs. All of them are mostly two months long. As I said already, we started with uh, the Akademik Fedorov uh, a couple of weeks ago. And in winter, we get visits from the Russian icebreaker Kapitan Dranitsin. And in summer, we will get visits from the icebreakers Oden from Sweden and Shulong from China. They will exchange scientists and crew members and will bring fuel and food. In spring, so in April, when the ice conditions does not allow to to come to Polarstern with an icebreaker, we use Antonov aircrafts from Russia to exchange the scientists and the crew. So the overarching goal of Mosaic is to investigate the coupled Arctic climate system. This coupled Arctic climate system contains out of the atmosphere, the sea ice, the ocean, the ecosystem, and the biogeochemistry. We not only want to investigate these um, disciplines itself, but we also want to have the interaction between all of these disciplines. And finally, when we have an, uh, a better knowledge and a lot of data out of our expedition, we will put everything into the climate and the weather forecast models to really improve them. So as I said in the beginning, Mosaic started already. We had a nice farewell event in Tromsø on September 20th, just before Polarstern leaves. We had speeches from our AVI director, Antje Boetius, and the German Minister of Education and Science, Anja Kalicek. We had a band playing, and we had time for a conversation and saying goodbye to individual people. Approximately 300 people participated in the event, and um, one part of the, of the farewell event is to say goodbye to the captain and to Markus Rex that will leave with Polarstern. I think now you have a rough overview about the uh, expedition and about Mosaic. So I think we can now come to the fun part to have a conversation with Markus Rex. Markus, can you hear me? 
Yes, Anja, I can hear you. I hope you can also hear me. Uh, hello, good afternoon, and greetings from the Central Arctic. Yeah, perfect, Markus. We can really great hear you. So, Markus, I would like to ask you to just introduce shortly yourself and explain your position in Mosaic and your task on Polarstern. Yes, I'm uh, the head of Mosaic and I'm the expedition leader here on the research platform. Okay, thank you. And, <laughs> um, and how are you feeling at the moment? So how is the weather conditions and how many hours of light have you during the day? Oh, yeah, we are having a good time. And uh, the reason for that is uh, we are ahead of schedule. We are safely moored to a near perfect ice flow, uh, given the overall thin ice conditions that we found during this uh, summer, late summer here in the Arctic. Uh, work is progressing on the flow as planned, and uh, that also uh, includes the setup of our wider network of research stations uh, around Polar Term. Uh, we are right now at uh, 85 degrees north and 135 degrees east, and that gives us around this time of the year still about six hours of twilight uh, per day, and that helps a lot with setting up the equipment on the ice and makes the work on the ice much, much easier. We, the temperatures are average as you would expect in the Arctic around this time of the year. We had it down to minus 17 degrees. We had some uh, medium storms, uh, but otherwise the conditions are very nice for, for the work outside. Okay, thank you very much. And what time is it actually on Polarstern now? Oh, on Polarstern here we uh, have switched to local time, so it's 10 minutes to 11 p.m. Uh, pretty late. <laughs> oh yeah, I can imagine it's a hard day for you. Um, and can you show you? Uh, can you shortly explain how the travel noise worked out and how the stage of the ice flow happened? Yeah, already to doing our travel into this region together with our partner icebreaker, the Academic Federal from Russia. Uh, we surveyed a large area of this part of the Arctic and looked at many ice flows. And it uh, soon turned out that the overall ice conditions uh, after this uh, extremely warm summer in the Arctic uh, were challenging for us. Um, the uh, average ice flows in this area have a thickness of only 60 to 80 centimeters. But of that ice, about half is completely eroded and it's a sponge-like uh, structure, lower 40 centimeters, which does not really uh, uh, contribute to the stability of the ice at all. So we found flows which only had 30 to 40 centimeters of stable ice, and that certainly uh, does, not, this, does not support an operation of the scale we have in mind. Therefore, soon it became clear we have to look for that special snowflake, that special ice flow which is different from the others, while also allowing us to look at the standard uh, ice uh, characteristics that we want to study. And we found that. We have an ice flow which is 3.5 by 2.5 kilometers large, and most of that flow is characteristic for the ice found here in, in these days in the Arctic. But there is embedded in this flow a 1.2 kilometer large, very compressed area with several meters of ice thickness and only a few uh, spots which are, which are really thin. And uh, we have moved to that one, and from that as our logistical hub, uh, we are now spread uh, to the thinner ice, which is characteristic for the rest of the flow. That sounds you are very happy with these ice flows. So how is the current status of setting up the ice camp and the distributed network? This is going well. The power network uh, that we need for the uh, heavy uh, large-scale research infrastructure that we are going to put on the ice here, the power network has been installed. Uh, we are in the process of installing the major infrastructures, uh, the hubs for the activity that then will spread out from these areas into the wider the domain of this flow. All that infrastructure is on safe ice on that compressed core, which provides us a safe uh, basis for the heavy infrastructure that is able to look at this thin and characteristic ice. Uh, we have a wide variety of different ice types in this area. We have large areas which have just been open water until a few days ago, which just freeze over. So we are able to also study the new ice formation and the full annual cycle of, of that uh, ice that is just about to form. So from that perspective, we are really happy with what we have here and also with the progress of the work. Perfect. And when do you think, can you start with the continuous measurements? And what is the expected outcome of this year-round expedition? Yeah. 
Um, I think we we'll need about another week or ten days to complete the setup of our uh, network here. We, we had some days today. We had to evacuate uh, the flow because polar bears came into the area. So this is a safety issue, so we evacuated the flow and uh, uh, waited until the bears passed. Uh, we also had to use some flare guns to uh, accelerate that process and to uh, show the bears that they should not uh, become uh, uh, used to stay close to our area. Um, that may happen in the future again, so uh, it's not everything can be planned here on a daily basis, uh, but I think in one week or ten days uh, we will be able to start the continuous measurements. And uh, could you repeat the second part of your question? The line was uh, briefly interrupted there. Uh, there was, uh, what are you expecting about the outcome of the year-round expedition? Um, I expect a breakthrough in the understanding of uh, the Arctic climate system. Uh, the Arctic is a region of our planet which, uh, where the warming is uh, most pronounced, most rapid. You all know that, but it's also the region where uh, we have the largest uncertainty in our climate projections. Uh, and we need robust climate projections from the Arctic because they, uh, the climate in the Arctic affects weather pattern and climate in the latitudes uh, where most of uh, the population of our planet lives in northern latitudes. It's very linked to the climate in the Arctic. And we need a robust scientific understanding as a basis for the uh, decisions that our societies now have to take to shape our future and uh, to, to plan how much uh, greenhouse gases we really want to emit. And uh, we need a good basis for, for these decisions. And for that is our mission to contribute to that. Okay, thank you, Markus Sofa. And I think now we can open up uh, for the questions from the audience. So please, if you have questions, just grab a microphone and ask them. When, while asking questions, please make sure that you are talking right into the microphone and have a uh, clear and short question so that uh, Markus knows when you finish speaking. Questions? Any questions? Ah, oh, there, yes. Hello. Um, first of all, thanks so much, Doctor, for uh, meeting with us virtually today. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of run us through like a uh, like general day on the boat, um, kind of like what that looks like and how often you guys stop to collect data um, and just like everyday life living on this ship. Thanks. Good question. Uh, yeah, it's a, a very good question. As you can imagine, perhaps during uh, such an intense phase of uh, such a major logistical operation and um, expedition of that kind, every day is different. Uh, so there, we don't have a fixed daily schedule yet. Maybe uh, in two weeks from now, when we are in our regular measurement phase, uh, we will uh, have much more fixed routines and uh, we have weekly schedules actually for carrying out the measurements. Right now, we typically go out in the morning, starting at 8 a.m. after breakfast, uh, to the ice. Many teams in parallel go to the ice. We first establish uh, safety. So polar bear guards go out first uh, to uh, make the area safe. And uh, then uh, the teams go to the ice and uh, start to work on the infrastructure. For a few days, we have worked on setting up the power lines. Now we are working on setting up huts and uh, covered areas, covered spaces for the big scientific instruments that we will soon deploy in, in these areas. Typically, people return to the vessel for lunch, uh, not always, it depends on their daily schedule. Some take uh, just some food out on the flow, uh, and then in the afternoon we continue. For some of that, we have daylight, and the rest of the work in the morning and evening hours, obviously, we uh, work in darkness and just in with our flashlights. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, over there. Uh, uh, my name is Maria, I come from Iceland. Um, I really adore what you're doing and I think it's very, very important, but my question comes from my own interests on clean energy initiatives. I would actually like to know what kind of fuel you are using in your ship for your main power and your auxiliary systems and how does it work? in these extreme environments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
um, the good thing is uh, we have switched off, off our uh, our um, engines. At least we have put them into idle. Uh, our expedition will be driven by the forces of wind and ice drift across uh, the North Pole area. So we uh, use much less fuel than a standard vessel because uh, we just passively drift with the ice driven by the wind. Um, that is uh, in itself, I think, the uh, cleanest way to do, to set up an Arctic expedition. Otherwise, uh, all the other expeditions uh, rely on heavy use of power from the engines to break through that ice. We don't do that. Um, of course, we are using uh, standard, the uh, clean version of the ship diesel. Uh, we have um, systems on board to clean our grey water and uh, that is a very efficient system so everything that goes overboard uh, is thoroughly cleaned. We bring back all our garbage, uh, there is nothing left here on the flow and uh, we take great care of our flow because we want to live here for one year and we need to uh, have a pristine and untouched environment so we do everything to reduce our impact. Uh, of course the footprint is not zero but I think it is about as small as it can be. Okay, and I think we have time for one last question, yes? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Josh Cahill, uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. I was curious for the scientists in the audience uh, how the, the data is actually flowing to collaborators and whether the window for collaborators to still uh, be a part of the mission uh, is open. Um, the window for participation, uh, as you probably can imagine, is, is closed. Uh, we have our team together for all the individual uh, phases of the expedition. Uh, that was a fairly long process, and I think we have an excellent team on board and an excellent uh, scientific plan. But the data uh, will be shared with the world, with everybody. Uh, it's open, it will be open after the expedition, after some period when people work on uh, finalizing the data products. It will be open to everybody and everybody can work with the data and that starts on the 1st of January of 2023. If you uh, have a scientific project that would uh, benefit from using Mosaic data before that date, on our website, there's a process described uh, where you can apply for still becoming part of Mosaic without participation in the expedition. And uh, you have to just briefly describe what your project uh, will deal with, and we just double we check whether that fits to the time span of Mosaic and whether it is not redundant with other plans from other groups involved. And then you get endorsed and get immediate access to the data. We are pretty open uh, with, with the data. We want to have it used by as many scientists as possible. Okay, great, thanks. So, so our application is in. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Markus, I will just ask a short uh, personal question. So you are staying until the beginning of January, I think, and what are you missing most apart from your family and friends? Hmm. You just missed, uh, just said apart from my family and friends, because of course I uh, wanted to say my, my family and my friends. Otherwise, uh, actually, I, I don't miss much right now. I'm. Uh, People are t uh, taking great care of us, the food is great, uh, we have a great atmosphere on board. I'm more worried about uh, what I am going to miss when I will be back home, the, the emptiness, the vast emptiness around us with the next uh, living person a thousand kilometers away, the uh, ice sculptures uh, which are uh, here on this flow, they have been formed in pressure ridges. Um, the fantastic light that we still have uh, with, with these uh, colorful twilight when the sun is just a couple of degrees below the horizon. Uh, the whole atmosphere in the Arctic is, is a, and just as always, when it's a for the next it will miss the head. Okay. Thank you very much, Markus, for your time. And I think you will go to bed now, or have you still something to do to work? I wish you uh, all the best for setting up the ice flow and for the start of the expedition. Thank you very much. I have just one last comment to make. So if you are interested in Mosaic and following Mosaic, just use our nice progressive web app. Just enter following.mosaic-expedition.org. 
Um, there you can always find where Polarstern is at the moment. You can see how it drifted. And there's always, every day, a nice picture and a short description. As well, you can see the weather conditions when you press these up button with the sun and the cloud, and you can compare the drift with the drift that Friedrich of Nansen does 125 years ago. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter with Mosaic Arctic, and on Instagram with Mosaic Underline Expedition. And of course, we have a web page there you can find more detailed information about the expedition. Thank you very much, and if you have questions, I am still here today, so just come to me.